Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm only sorry to disappoint that I will not be describing my personal genome experiment with my Icelandic wife. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, I have a slightly strange title because I have um, a, a parenthesis in it. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was um, about how high throughput sequencing is informing functional genomics. And um, in particular, I want to talk about a slew of new um, experiments, really molecular biology experiments that are based on sequencing. That is to say, not DNA sequencing per se, but experiments uh, in molecular biology based on sequencing. And <coughs> analysis of, this, of these experiments is, is a key issue, both um, just in actually their execution, but also their interpretation. However, it's typically, right now, I think fair to say, somewhat of an afterthought in the field. So, um, so it will be the emphasis of the talk, but before I start uh, talking about the analysis, I first want to tell you a little bit what I mean exactly by uh, sequence-based functional genomics. So um, this is kind of a paradigm that I think was established maybe five or six years ago. And the idea was that um, you'd like to measure something. I'll give many examples in a second. And in order to measure this thing, uh, the idea was that you would leverage high throughput sequencing, not for the purpose of really directly sequencing DNA, but rather for the purpose of using the sequencing um, as a form of beam counting uh, to infer your measurement back. So there's a kind of process to this idea. Um, uh, I call it star seek for wild card uh, experiment plus sequencing. So they're also called sequence census methods. And they basically look like this. Somebody thinks of something they want to measure, and they become creative, and they figure out how to reduce that to a sequencing uh, experiment. Um, then there's a lot of sequencing going on. You get reads. Um, these reads then require um, some processing, uh, usually a statistical model to make sense of them, and then an actual computation. And then you go back and solve what I call an inverse problem. Uh, I'll give examples of those in a second. And you infer your measurement back. Uh, once you have that measurement, then you can go on and do fun uh, functional genomics or computational biology. So this is the general idea. And the first such example was an assay called ChipSeq. Uh, I think it was published around 2007. Um, the way this, uh, so people, uh, as many of you know, had been doing chip experiments for a while to measure protein DNA binding. Uh, but now the idea was to modify the assay in such a way that uh, you would sequence fragments uh, that were pulled down after immunoprecipitation, uh, sequence them, and then align them back to a genome uh, to find out, as I indicate there uh, with these peaks, uh, I think you can see them right there, uh, you, you would look back and see where the binding really happened. So this was sort of the first assay. Once you have that, then there's a whole downstream analysis of actually figuring out um, how the protein is binding DNA and so forth and so on. Um, but this is sort of following this general principle. This is the measurement you would like to make. In and of itself, it doesn't appear to have anything to do with sequencing, but by a bunch of interesting chemistry and biology, you sequence and you get your measurement back. Um, there are uh, many other assays like this now. The most popular, I think, is RNA-seq, which is rapidly replacing microarrays as the favored method for measuring gene expression. It's the same idea, but now instead of measuring protein binding, you're measuring the abundance of various RNA molecules. Um, the way you do that is by converting them into DNA, which you can sequence, and by randomly sampling the RNA, you hope to be able to infer the abundances back. Again, there's a final analysis step after doing the experiment. You would then like to compare perhaps different samples and so on and figure out if those pie charts are really the same as they appear to be or maybe there are slight differences. So there is always a downstream analysis, but then there's also an analysis in actually inferring the abundances of the RNAs in this case uh, from the sequence itself. So there are many, many assays like this. This is from a recent review. Um, describing the overall molecular biology of the cell in a sort of a, a simplistic cartoon, and describing tons of different experiments. You may, I, I've discussed ChIP-seq, um, but there are many, many others. Uh, RNA-seq you may have heard of, but you may not have heard of, of all of these. Um, these various experiments uh, are each unique. Uh, 
They involve individual chemistry and different, you know, uh, biology and chemistry to create the DNA sequencing libraries. Um, their analysis is often quite different, but they share this commonality of reducing a measurement you want to make into a, um, a sequencing experiment. I think what's really fascinating is that although assays such as RNA-seq are fairly uh, obvious, you might think, okay, it's not that a big of a deal to convert the RNA into DNA and then sequence it. Some of these assays are really non-trivial. Um, and I'd like to focus in on um, uh, an, an assay uh, uh, for measuring the actual geometry of the, uh, of the DNA. Uh, there are actually many of these now. Um, the, the one that I think is uh, the most interesting is called high c It's sort of followed on on uh, 3C, 4C, and 5C, and a number of assays to do this. It was published uh, maybe three or four years ago by uh, Erez Lieberman Aden. Um, and in a sort of quite a clever experiment, he figured out how to utilize sequencing to figure out which DNA bases are physically near each other in the folded chromatin. Um, and the way he does that is by a fairly elaborate um, experiment where he cross-links the DNA, uh, then it's uh, digested with restriction enzymes, um, marked with biotin, uh, and I, I won't today explain these assays in detail, but basically by clever chemistry and biology, you end up with a picture like this, which is a matrix of the genome, um, where you have a measurement for every pair of nucleotides uh, of really uh, how close they are in three-dimensional space. Now, the resolution isn't at the nucleotide level yet uh, of this kind of assay. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the chromosomes, but it is at the resolution of a couple of hundred base pairs. And then you can, of course, use that both to study just the intrinsic geometry and folding of the genome, but also to ask which genes are near each other proximally in space. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting assay. Um, a few years ago uh, at Berkeley, we developed a similar assay for RNA structure. Uh, it's called ShapeSeq. Uh, the idea there is to measure which nucleotides not are uh, adjacent to each other in three-dimensional space, but simply paired. And the way this is done is by modifying the RNA uh, in such a way that after it's modified, reverse transcriptase will drop off at the modification. Uh, and if the modification is done in a way such that it's sensitive to the base pairing, then by sequencing the resulting fragments, you can infer something about what was base paired. So again, it's a kind of interesting assay where the sequencing is being used to actually inform you about structure. And there are many variants of this experiment as well now, including um, uh, uh, you know, work to try to figure out how to actually find not just paired nucleotides, but proximal ones. And I think this is really changing the entire field of RNA secondary structure prediction. Uh, you can actually inform now all the computational algorithms with experiments, and this is a very interesting field, how to do that. Um, I, uh, in preparing for this talk, I, I tried to actually assemble a list of all of the methods that exist for to doing these kind of things, and I've found about 40. Um, uh, these are the ones, uh, I've gone over some of these already. Um, there are recent assays for measuring all sorts of things like RNA editing, rep re replication initiation. Essentially, all of molecular biology is being transformed uh, and essentially becoming sequencing based. And probably, I think if it's not already true, I suspect that the majority of sequencing will be devoted to these experiments rather than DNA sequencing because you sequence a person's genome maybe once um, and, and you have the genome, unless they have cancer, there really isn't a reason to sequence them over and over. But in these assays, they're dependent on, you know, time, uh, tissue, and so on. So you need to, th th there really is no limit to how much sequencing will be done for all these experiments. But I think the, there is one experiment that really comes from outer space, literally, uh, which is my favorite. Um, it is a, a recent proposal by George Church and some physicists to actually measure um, weakly interacting uh, massive particles coming through the Earth. Their idea is to build a detector where you tether single-stranded DNA to arrays, and particles will slice the DNA, which you would then uh, uh, sequence to figure out exactly where the particles passed. Um, so this isn't an actual existing experiment yet. They've, they're quite serious and have written a, a quite a detailed proposal to do this. And I just wanted to give this example because I really think the imagination is the limit with sort of what is now, uh, can be accomplished by leveraging the high throughput uh, nature of DNA sequencing and its cheap cost. So, uh, so having said that, uh, and given you a brief introduction to all of these uh, various assays, 
Uh, I'd like to really uh, turn to the focus of the talk, which is uh, how they're analyzed. And there are actually really two different types of analyses that go on. Um, and they're sometimes confounded with each other. They're really related, uh, and I'd like to explain the difference. So I, I would say that as an end result of these experiments, uh, you're really measuring um, a lot of things about the genome, and you've really done functional genomics in a genome-wide sense that was previously not possible. And then it's really a, a new endeavor to analyze uh, the genome from this point of view. For the first time, we have multiple measurements genome-wide of very many, many, many aspects of the, of the, of the cell. And so I, I call that maybe analysis of functional genomics, uh, where the fact that you did it by sequencing is really not so interesting other than that it allowed you to do the experiment. But there's another sense in which analysis is really key right now, which is that the experiments themselves are relatively non-trivial. And what comes out of them is masses of DNA sequence, but in and of themselves, they're not very interesting. You really want to know the measurements. And so there's really, I think, uh, a, a blooming industry of figuring out methods for the analysis of the sequence itself to accurately obtain the measurements. It's more a technical issue, but often these days, um, if you're a, 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 being able to do the technical aspect of the analysis well, uh, also sometimes leads to insights about new possible kinds of functional genomics analyses. So these two things go hand in hand, and I'd like to start by talking about the latter, and then I'll turn a little bit to the former and give you an overview. So the latter part, which is the sequence analysis, um, has everything to do with solving this inverse problem. You wanted to make the measurement, you did a lot of sequencing, and now you need to go back to figure out your measurement and solve this inverse problem of going from the sequence to the measurement. And I think there are really two uh, parts to this, uh, to this kind of analysis. Um, and I've separated them here. The fragments you get out, they were obtained from what I call target sequences. In the case of, for example, it's good to keep in mind RNA-seq, those target sequences would be the transcripts. But in other experiments, uh, there may be other things. For example, in a metagenomic setting, which falls under this rubric, um, the target sequences would be the genomes. And the first step in the, kind of analysis, in the sequence analysis is to figure out where the fragments came from from the target sequences. The second step is to look the other way around at the target sequences and figure out how many reads covered every position. And these two problems are obviously very related. Um, and their solution is really what allows you always, in all of these experiments, to actually obtain your measurement. Just to be very clear, what I mean by fragment assignment is that for every read, you, uh, you would like to find the target sequence and the position from which that read, read originated. And I'll explain in a second why that's very difficult to do often, and in some sense impossible. Uh, the best you can hope for is a guess at where the read actually originated from. The second problem I'd like to also be quite precise about is not just to look at the coverage uh, at every position on every target, but to normalize for it uh, according to the biases in the experiment. So in many of these experiments, by the nature of the experiment, you don't expect to cover the targets uniformly with reads when you sequence at random. And so you need to kind of deconvolve or invert the distribution so that you really figure out what you really wanted to know about the coverage at that position. So I'll explain that also in a second, but that's what I call the read uh, or fragment density and, uh, uh, estimation. Pictorially, uh, the first problem involves taking the reads and checking or finding out exactly where they come from, and the second problem involves making these sort of coverage plots, which you've seen maybe if you've done ChIP-seq, uh, which is what I'm calling the density estimation. So those are the two complementary problems, and they're very related. Figuring out where to send the reads has everything to do with understanding the biases down here in the coverage, and of course, figuring out the coverage has everything to do with where you think the reads came from. So they uh, sort of go together. Um, I'd like to uh, focus on, the, on the, both the problems, one at a time. Uh, first, I'll talk about the fragment assignment. And to understand why it's sort of an interesting question and what goes into its solution, uh, you have to think sort of statistically from a model point of view. And I've shown, I'm showing a graphical model here for the fragment assignment problem, but I'd like to first walk you through the right-hand side here. And Imagine that you, we're producing a generative model of the experiment. So the way you should think about this is that um, 
we're going to take uh, 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 our transcripts and pretend we're doing a random sequencing experiment and actually generate a read. So I'm going to propose a methodology by which this might happen in a stochastic process. First, I will take an, uh, a distribution and I will pick from it a size of which to make a fragment. So fragments might be short or they might be long because the fragmentation is random. And so I'm going to pick a fragment size. Um, then I'm going to pick a transcript from among, uh, or not a transcript, I should say, target sequence from among my many targets. And I will choose after that a position in that target and I will create a read um, uh, f uh, or a pair and read if, if we want to get technical at that position um, uh, of the appropriate length that I've already selected. After I sele have selected the position, I'm actually going to make the sequence of the fragment. Of course, it comes from the target itself, but it might have additional error. And on the left-hand side here, I'm showing the various parts of this model. Uh, we understand quite well from many of the technologies now the nature of the error. For example, this is, comes from data for Illumina sequencing, where the error increases as you go through the read. And although there are actually sort of interesting artifacts, sometimes there's more error right in the first position. It's something many people uh, forget. But you can generally build profiles of error and then use these to um, later figure out where your reads really came from. I just want to say that this process actually gets quite complicated because errors occur in different ways. You might have mismatches where instead of the actual target base, it's recorded as some other base, but you might also have insertions and deletions. This affects certain platforms uh, particularly. And also, there are other effects that should not be forgotten in certain settings. For example, in, in, transcri in transcriptome sequencing in RNA-seq, um, there is actually editing, that is to say post-transcriptional modification of the RNA in which bases are changed, and that will, be, um, that will manifest itself as recurrent difference between the sequenced reads and the target sequences. So um, sometimes those sort of differences are thrown out as artifact, but they may not be. Um, we actually have a poster on this tomorrow if you're interested. Um, so uh, all of these issues make the reads different from the targets and complicate the problem of figuring out where they originated from. Uh, the way that one would go about actually figuring things out is write out a probabilistic formula for the probability of the read coming from every position in every target. And I've just thrown up a lot of math here not to uh, uh, you know, uh, explain all of it in detail, I don't think that's necessary, but to show you that there really is a formula that you can write out in terms of all the different parameters you might include that will really give you a likelihood uh, for the read. Uh, and I want to just emphasize something about these two formulas here. This likelihood, it's an overall probability of seeing the read. And it's obtained by actually summing up the probability for the read coming from every single position in every single transcript. So it's really a kind of uh, complete probability of you know, looking at all possible scenarios for how this read could have been made. Now many of them are very unlikely because the sequence of the read is just very different from the target. And so what people do in practice is they approximate this likelihood um, and it's not necessary to understand all the math here, except that there's now a new sum. It looks slightly different than the old one. And it basically refers to the fact that instead of looking at all positions, you only look at a subset of them, which are obtained by mapping the reads to the targets with read mapping software. So that might be software like Bowtie that you've heard of, or Top Hat, or other mapping tools. And that simplifies this problem, but it is, then becomes a, a, approximate. The way you actually obtain assignments for the reads now, in terms of where they actually came from, is to maximize this likelihood. In other words, to figure out the parameters that make it most likely to have seen the data, and then to calculate a posterior probability, an actual value for every position uh, that gives you the likelihood that the read came from that place. And there are many ways to do this, but one popular way is the EM algorithm. It was actually rediscovered for this problem in the context of RNA-seq by the author of the first paper, Ali Mordazavi. He called it the rescue method. But it goes back, as far as I know, to actually the EST literature, at least for this particular problem, um, by Chris Lee from UCLA. And it's now kind of the standard way that people 
do fragment assignment um, in many, many settings. The algorithm is actually very simple. I'm showing here an example from RNA-seq where I've shown just a handful of reads. The way the algorithm actually works is very intuitive, which is why it keeps getting rediscovered, is you start off assuming um, something about, let's say in the case of RNA-seq, that your abundances of your molecules are all equal, and you assign your reads according to that assumption. You then re-update your actual estimates for the abundances now that you've made an assignment, and then you repeat that process. So it's, it's sort of like an iterative process by which you first naively split reads in cases where there's ambiguity, uh, and then as you learn more and more about your assay and what really happened in the experiment, you become wiser and smarter about where you send the reads. I'd like to turn now to the fragment density estimation part. That has to do with sort of normalizing out biases that affect the coverage at every position. In the case of RNA-seq, there's, a, 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 there's a, many uh, a aspects to the actual protocols that bias the coverage and make it non-uniform. Uh, again, I mean, if you look at a specific transcript, you don't see sort of flatness of the number of reads covering every position. One of them has to do with the way that the cDNA is created from the RNA in, in uh, one of the more popular protocols. There are many, many different protocols, and it could uh, form an entire lecture. But the main protocols currently favored use what's called random hexamer priming, which leads to a bias. If you look at uh, transcripts and you look at the sequences where reads start, then you would expect to see uniformity, which I'm showing up there. But what you actually observe is what's shown on the top row is a bias towards very specific nucleotides. And this means that the coverage doesn't look even. So you need to essentially normalize for that, and that's what I really mean by fragment density estimation. Um, uh, we wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago, about how to do this. Um, just to give you an example, um, uh, this is a, a real uh, RNA-seq uh, uh, experiment, and you're looking at a gene. The blue lines here are the actual coverage of various positions in that gene, and you can see they're very non-uniform. And down below, we're showing after looking at the entire experiment in its totality and learning the bias, we have predicted this bias in green down below. So you can see that it's not perfect, but you can actually learn uh, a good part of what's causing non-uniformity, then normalize for that and obtain a new kind of value for the number of reads you really think came from that transcript, having accounted for these biases. In other words, and I think this is a very important point in all of these experiments, there are two kinds of counts. People always talk about counts in sequence census experiments. There are sort of the estimated counts. If you look at a target, you look at your reads that you mapped there, and you can estimate how many reads of the ones you saw really came from there. If you're not, you know, the simplest thing is just to look at unique reads. That's an estimate. But if you account for all the ambiguity, as I've suggested, then you might get a distribution for the actual number of reads that you sequenced that came from that target. But there's another kind of count that we like to call effective counts, which is how many reads you would have seen at, uh, uh, from the target if there had been no bias in the experiment of the kind, for example, that I just described. And it's really the effective counts that are really of interest in almost all of these assays in terms of the measurement. So whether it's the RNA secondary structure or the 3D chromatin or chip seq or methyl seq or any of the many sequencing experiments, you don't really care about the exact reads you saw you would like to know what would have really happened if there had been no bias in the experiment. And so it's really important to keep conceptually those two types of counts uh, uh, apart. So now I'd like to turn to the analysis part of the actual function genomics. Um, I've described a little bit how you go about, you know, the mechanics of getting estimates. Um, and really now comes the interesting part. You'd really like to figure out now uh, basically how biology works. And as I've shown you here, there are many, many experiments you can do now. And uh, it's occurred to quite a few people that it would be fun to perform all these experiments simultaneously, um, maybe in very specific tissues that one is interested in, maybe in specific cancers, or there is a, 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 a sort of vanity science paper, another one last year, where somebody did this on themselves. Okay? So they measured all these different things on themselves. Um, perhaps the poster child for this is the ENCODE project. Um, 
Uh, there was a publication last year filling an entire journal of nature, and I don't know if you've read these papers, they're organized into sort of 13, 13 topics. Um, there's maybe 30 papers just in this journal, but there are many other uh, accompanying papers. That's because they just did a ton of these different experiments in many different tissues, and uh, then sort of tried to put this all together. And it's an enormous challenge. I just made a little cartoon to sort of outline what, what this looks like, really, is that you have a genome, and at every position of the genome now, you are producing essentially a massive matrix where the rows of this matrix represent different states. Uh, what I mean by state is maybe a different tissue, uh, maybe an individual cell type, uh, a different uh, developmental time period that you might be looking at in, in an experiment. Or it could actually be um, a value for expression or some other thing you're measuring that's person specific. So, you know, you, you really, the number of rows here is infinite uh, in this matrix, and someday we will be measuring many, many, many things. Um, and then the columns are the assays. I've just shown you that you already have about 40 to choose from. There are a lot fewer than that in the, in the ENCODE project, but there are many more coming. So you have a massive matrix uh, to examine at every single one of these positions on the genome, and now you're kind of asking, you know, how do I put this together? Um, I don't want to explain uh, what people are doing now. I, from my personal point of view, there's really interesting work in this direction, but it's still rather immature in the sense that I, I think, you know, there, there needs to be a lot of thought put into how to, like, really do this uh, well. I, I wanted to give the simplest case study, um, which is uh, uh, the case of differential expression in RNA-seq. I think this is the simplest setting because uh, what I mean by red and blue here is you've looked at only two conditions, so there are only two rows now to the matrix, and only one column, only RNA-seq. So you really have restricted your analysis down now, uh, and you're looking at really the simplest case. Um, the kind of question you ask in the simplest setting is, you know, is there a difference between condition A and condition B? One thing people have already realized, um, which, you know, uh, it's kind of funny because in the case of microarrays, this also took a little time, is that a single experiment by itself really is not so informative because of all the biological variability in cells. So at the minimum, you might do a few replicates in measuring the expression in condition A and condition B in blue and red. Um, you will do all the sequencing to uh, figure out what the expression values were, and then you would like to do a comparison. I really think this is the very simplest case uh, of the ENCODE analysis, and yet it's a, an analysis that's been given considerable attention. Um, uh, at, the latest uh, at the latest count that I've done, there are now 100 papers just on how to do differential expression for RNA-seq. Um, and there are many conflicting points of view of how to do this, let alone the entire uh, big matrix. This is a typical kind of pipeline that people consider. Um, this is from one of the papers uh, for differential expression. You might do, um, you, you know, you, you take your RNA-seq and you uh, try to do your fragment assignment. Typically, these days in differential expression, people avoid all of the complex math I just showed because it just is a bit overwhelming. They might just look at the unique reads, for example, that map to a gene. And then they look at, um, you know, sample A and sample B, and they might try to normalize a little bit. There is variability when they've done replicates. So kind of try to normalize the counts so that things look a little bit more stable if there's been variation in the experiments. Then p-values are computed and you do your standard thing of looking for which genes are outliers. Um, and you get some visualization tool. Underlying almost all approaches nowadays is this principle that one should really try to keep things simple. Um, and avoid really the sequence analysis part that I talked about previously of doing the density estimation and the fragment assignment because it just feels complicated and it's a bit overwhelming. So what people do is they say, well, we know that ignoring all of those issues maybe is not quite the right thing to do, but if you only care about comparisons, then wrong cancels out wrong. So, you know, maybe it's not uh, uh, such a big deal. I mention this because I think in sequence census, it's become actually a principle underlying a lot of the analyses that are done. 
the data is quite complicated, so it's very tempting to simplify matters by realizing that when you're only interested in comparison, you can hope to cancel biases out. But I'd like to make the point today that, unfortunately, in the context of sequence census, this is not a good idea. Um, we wrote a paper at the end of last year with this little thought experiment, um, just for the case of RNA-seq. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm in a math department, so I have to have a little bit of, uh, you have to do a little bit of math homework in every one of my talks. Um, in this example, there are two isoforms in a gene. And they're labeled blue and red. And these, these lengths here, they're L and E of the X, the exon, the interior exon has length E. That's just set up so that um, blue has length 2L and red has length L. So blue is twice as long. If blue is twice as long, then even if they're equally abundant, you expect to see twice as many reads there. Okay? So uh, coming from it. Now I'm showing two conditions here and a very simplistic thought experiment showing reads coming from blue or red. And then I'm computing the log fold change. Now the way I'm doing it is by a simple method that people know and acknowledge is biased and, and, and not so good, but that they hope cancels out when you do a comparison between conditions. So two popular methods or what I call union count, where you say, let me not worry about the isoforms, I'll just take all the reads that map to the locus, and just count them up. The second um, uh, approach is called intersect count, which says I will just look at the regions shared in common, because I'm really interested in the gene expression and I don't care about the isoforms. And because I don't care about the isoforms, and hopefully I can avoid this problem of trying to assign probabilistically the reads between isoform A and B. Uh, as I talked about before. So in this hope to avoid the statistics I discussed, uh, people do this, and what I've shown here is the log full change you obtain um, when you do these different things. So in the case of the union count, I think there are seven, eight, nine, ten reads in both conditions, so 10 divided by 10 is one, and log, base, you know, log of one is zero, so that's why there's a zero there. Whereas if you do the intersection, you only get the right-hand side, and it's eight over seven. So you just get different log full change. Um, it can go either way, actually, in these two methods, and both of them are different from the actual truth. So in you know, in re when we actually do an experiment, we don't know the actual, these reads are not labeled red or blue. They're ambiguous between the isoforms, and so the best we can hope to do is to actually estimate this truth. And by the statistical algorithm I showed before, albeit not explained in great detail, there is a guarantee, actually, that the, if you have sufficient data, you can approximate this arbitrarily well. So you can actually find out the truth, and there's no reason to hide from it. Using naive heuristics is dangerous, because wrong may not cancel out wrong. Now, when I show this thought experiment these days, people often say, well, that's all very nice, but does it really matter? Maybe in practice, this silly little kind of thing doesn't really happen. So we did an analysis, and uh, I'm going to show to you that I really think that wrong does not cancel out wrong, even in practice. Uh, a quick aside and advertisement, uh, my collaborator and colleague Miramit Singer uh, is giving a talk this afternoon explaining a similar principle that has bedeviled many, many methylation analyses, uh, where people are analyzing uh, genome-wide methylation these days. So I'll advertise that talk, and you can see something uh, similar in, uh, in, in, uh, in flavor, but in very different in detail and in, in uh, in context. So we did an experiment where, uh, we did a massive RNA-seq experiment um, where we took uh, two conditions, and um, these are actually from a Hox uh, knockdown experiment, but it's really not important for this purpose what the exact experiment was. You should just think condition A and B. And we did a lot of massive RNA-seq experiments to be sure that we had um, a deep RNA sequence to measure expression accurately, and lots of it. We also did three replicates for a total of about a billion reads. And in, a, I think, something of a uh, sort of that's not done so often, we actually replicated the exact experiment in, in microarrays. So we took the same samples and did multiple replicates also in microarrays so that we could measure log full change completely independently. And what I'm showing here is the log full change that you obtain um, by uh, head of the arrow, which is by intersection count, so that is, you take every one of these dots as a gene, and you just count the number of reads that are 
shared, or that I should say that are in regions shared between all the isoforms that constitute the gene. And the tail of the arrows is what you get by doing the inference uh, that I discussed before of trying to actually figure out the truth statistically. Uh, we've implemented that in this case in a program called Cufflinks, and the actual software within Cufflinks that does this is called Cuffdiff. So what you can see is that, you know, the, the tail, you know, the arrows are all pointing at the straight line, which is what you would hope to see is that the RNA-seq agrees with the microarrays. So I hope that's somewhat convincing evidence that this is a good thing to do, you know, to estimate the true log fold change. If you don't get the log fold change correctly, then it doesn't really matter how much fancy statistics you do after that, taking into account biological replicates and whatnot else. If your log fold change is wrong, then you cannot accurately estimate differential expression. Um, and really, to hammer home the point, we took a number of tools. I'm showing here one of the tools that's widely used called DSeq, but we actually took a number of others. And we did the same thing with them. It's not just our intersection count that's maybe, uh, you know, maybe we uh, implemented it in a way to favor ourselves. If you run the standard software, the log fold change is inaccurate and greatly improved if you actually estimate exact abundance. So this is all kind of bad news. The good news is that there are many methods now um, recently developed trying to do the right thing. There was a, a very nice talk yesterday uh, by Peter Glaus uh, about a method called BitSeq if you're doing differential expression. Um, we have the tool cufflinks I've already mentioned to do this and there may be a handful of others that are using, um, you know, doing fragment assignment and density estimation um, and trying to actually uh, you know, figure out uh, the true counts, uh, the true effective counts, in order, uh, not the true counts, but the true effective counts in order to get log fold change correct in order to do differential expression. In other assays, there's less of it going on. In the case of ChIP-seq, there's a method called Mosaics out of the University of Wisconsin, and uh, we've recently tried to adapt one of our tools, which I'll talk about in a second, called Express, uh, for doing this in ChIP-seq so that you can actually identify protein DNA binding in repetitive regions, which have been ignored completely in ChIP-seq, essentially because people hoped to avoid uh, statistics. Um, it is true, uh, sometimes people ask me whether any of this is really interesting because soon we'll be able to sequence very long, infinitely long reads on a USB key right here at the podium. But the thing about many of these assays is that by their very nature, um, often because of uh, cross-linking pull-down combinations, uh, you, you cannot really, you know, the reads will never be long because the actual protocol creates short fragments by its very design. So it is true that some of these issues will be mitigated in the coming years, but for, for the foreseeable future, and especially for many of the experiments, there's no other way right now than to have short reads and to deal with all these issues. Um, I also wanted to point out that there are many, many interesting open problems. Um, there are both new directions in technology that are enabling new kinds of experiments with new challenges. I gave as one example here single cell analysis, which has only started really this year uh, in the case of uh, expression. There are uh, three papers in the last six or nine months on single cell RNA-seq and many more coming. Um, I haven't talked about this at all in my talk and I regret it just because there wasn't enough time, but obtaining the targets is sometimes easy because uh, you might be doing RNA-seq in the human genome and there's already a pretty good annotation and those genes are your targets. But in many settings of these experiments, the target sequences themselves are not known and need to be assembled or can be assembled from the reads themselves. Um, and this problem of assembly of short reads for these assays, unlike DNA sequence assembly, is much uh, less explored and I would say currently really wide open. There are a few tools but much, much work to be done. And finally, I, I've already talked about, uh, I hinted at the kind of challenges in ENCODE, but really extending the kind of work on differential expression, which I tried to argue is already quite complicated, to really doing all the different assays simultaneously is very challenging. And I would argue that the ENCODE analysis is really still open entirely. Even with 30 papers published, there's really a, a lot to do there. And there are a lot of recent data sets being produced that are performing all these sequence uh, uh, star seq assays. Um, TCJ is a big cancer project that's doing this. Uh, uh, there are more ENCODE projects uh, going on another round now. So there will be tons of tons of data.
There's no shortage of data. And speaking of that, I'd actually like to turn briefly uh, back to my title and extend it a little bit uh, and add something very crucial, which I haven't talked about yet, which is actually the size of the data. Um, there is a huge challenge in everything I've discussed so far in terms of the amount of data. I am going to show the obligatory slide uh, of increasing uh, uh, sequence amount with time. I believe people now just sort of gloss their eyes and it's just going up. And we all know there's lots of sequence and it's, uh, uh, it's cheaper and faster uh, to produce it. And I think what's happened is we've entered what I call the curse of deep sequencing, where the extra sequence is almost not helping. It's just a headache. I've listed here some of the issues that I think are worth discussing briefly. First of all, current sequencing data sets for the kinds of experiments I've discussed are reaching the stage where it's impossible to store all the information in memory of a reasonable machine. Um, and it's also impossible to look at the, you know, keep accessing the, the alignment files or the sequence files. So there's sort of an infrastructure problem. And partly because computer memory is very expensive and limited, unlike disk. Secondly, I, I mentioned, that I, I write here that sequencing is static. And what I mean by that is the current way that things work is that uh, biologists go out and produce samples. Uh, they sequence them to an arbitrary depth of sequencing based on their budget allowance or their gut feeling. Uh, computer scientists are usually not so involved in that process. Computer scientists then uh, get these huge files from the biologists and there's usually no going back and doing another experiment. So um, that's a bit of an issue. And yet analysis may need to be repeated, both experimentally but also uh, uh, analytically. And what I mean by that is that often these experiments right now are really producing interesting data that we don't even know yet sometimes what the good questions about it will be. And so ever, all of this information has to be stored. So all of these are enormous challenges. And there's you know, a buzzword right now, a big data in machine learning circles. Uh, but we're certainly customers of this, but in a kind of very different sense that's not usually articulated. In big data meetings of machine learning meetings that I attend occasionally, um, people have much larger data sets than we have. I mean, if you think about photos uh, or the amounts just of streaming text produced by Twitter or Facebook in a day, it's just much more massive than all of our uh, terabytes. In fact, when I sometimes show uh, that previous slide, you know, people laugh and they're you know, why is this a problem? Um, but our data is much more complex. So, the, for two, in two ways. Streaming through uh, Twitter files, uh, there's only one kind of thing you're going to see. It's just text. You know exactly what you're getting, and that's that. Um, in our case, these DNA sequences, yeah, they're all the same, but they represent information from completely different experiments. And so that's a really, really big difference. And also the questions are not um, uh, always uh, clear. In the case of photos, there are many things you can do with image databases, but many of the kinds of things people want to do are pretty clear and cut. You know, there's face recognition, this and that. Um, and many, many people working on those things. In this case, in many of the settings we work, we don't even know the questions we want to ask about the data. So I think the complexity is very different and that makes our big data challenging even if in sheer size it's actually not so bad. Uh, so there are many, many moving parts. The technologies are changing. Uh, you know, we, we went from single to paired end reads and now much longer reads and then different insert sizes in the fragments and all of this changes the analysis infrastructure. So it's all, uh, it's all quite complicated and there's a final point I want to make which is that naive heuristics in many of the algorithms start really breaking down uh, when there are errors and lots of sequence. To give an example, we've done some tests with assembly algorithms where the more sequence you throw at the algorithm, the worse it gets. Because there are errors in the, in, in, in the reads, uh, these assembly, you know, the short read assemblers, sometimes they, they just start, uh, you know, because eventually you see every error. If you sequence long enough, everything happens. And so you really need sort of some intelligent statistics to sort out error from reality. And, you, you know, heuristics uh, may fail. So a number of solutions proposed for all of these issues. Um, one is data compression. I believe there's actually a talk right, right following this on, on sort of compressive genomics. 
And that will become very important uh, in the coming years. Um, and hot ideas in machine learning are streaming algorithms and cloud computing. And we've been examining these directions. Uh, we developed a program called Express, uh, which was just published uh, earlier this year uh, with my student, Adam Roberts, who's giving a poster, um, as I said, tomorrow on RNA editing, but also uh, today we have a, a poster on, uh, on this uh, Express as well. Um, it's not a, uh, it's a sort of very general tool just for the fragment assignment and density estimation. Um, we uh, have applied it to RNA-seq, but it's really quite a general tool. And its goal is to be able to do this processing very fast. And so it's based on the idea of streaming algorithms, where you examine the reads just one at a time. So the infrastructure looks like this. We have uh, really just as the input to the program, the reads and um, their alignments to uh, the target sequences uh, as a pre-filter to approximate that likelihood as I discussed before. For the purposes of what I'm gonna talk about for the fragment assignment with an algorithm like this, we'd actually like the mapping to be very loose. We don't want to make decisions about what's a real mapping or not because we're gonna do that with the fragment assignment algorithm. But we need some sort of simplification. We can't consider every possible position for every read. And the algorithm is actually quite simple. It's a recursive algorithm. Uh, I won't explain it in great detail, except to say that we take literally one read out of the file, and then we do something to it. Uh, we essentially run a version of the EM algorithm that I showed before. Um, there is some cleverness here in, in building streaming algorithms, and there's one in, in this particular algorithm, in that there's a schedule. You kind of need to weigh the data more and more as you go through the algorithm. Because initially, when you see your first few reads, you don't know anything yet about the measurement you're trying to make, and therefore you can't do the fragment assignment accurately. But as you see more data, you become more confident, and so that's, this M stands for mass, and the reads kind of count for more as you go through intuitively. And then you update parameters, and you go back and pick up a new read. So the algorithm is very simple, and it has no um, uh, memory issues. In fact, the memory is constant because you're only looking at one read at a time. In fact, and, and the running time for this is also very nice because it's some constant factor more than just literally reading the file. So this is efficiency at its best. And um, uh, what you get out is kind of the, uh, what you want from these sort of fragment assignment, the estimated counts, and very importantly, the effective counts. So in this particular program, we learn a, a number of biases that, that affect read coverage, um, but there's, of course, much more work that could be done because many of the different experiments have different kinds of issues. What we actually do in this program that's, I think, quite useful, uh, and I wanted to point out to people, is that we report then at the end for every read, not anymore just you know, a single position from whence it came, but a distribution over locations where we think the read actually came from with probabilities associated to those assignments. So you can use this in downstream in uh, many different applications if you're interested. We've also explored cloud computing as a framework for this particular fragment assignment tool. Um, uh, Adam uh, has recently implemented this uh, in a new language called Spark, uh, which uh, has some advantages over uh, sort of standard MapReduce. And um, I, I won't talk about this in detail right now, but it's a distributed platform for essentially running the same algorithm. And it has advantages that um, it, it's running, it's really using all the data at the same time the streaming algorithm pays the price that you don't get to see all the data at once. Um, and it can run sort of on, on Amazon infrastructure uh, in a relatively straightforward way. So to conclude, uh, I, this is kind of the overview I wanted to give. I, I hope I've convinced you that in this, uh, uh, in the last two boxes of, of this kind of stream of ideas that form these new assays, uh, there's a lot of interesting computational biology. There are a lot of challenges, both technical in the sequence analysis and then functionally in the functional genomics. Um, we really, uh, th there needs to be a lot of help from all of you in solving these challenges because, as I said, the number of assays are increasing rapidly and it's not scalable to have the local statistician or computer scientist uh, try to figure out new development for new methodology for scratch with every one of these assays. Uh, so just to conclude, I'd like to thank um, many of my current and former students uh, with whom I've had lots of conversations about various aspects 
to form this kind of view of sequence uh, analysis or sequence census analysis that I've presented today. Um, they, many of them have worked in, in different tools in different parts of this. Uh, I haven't discussed some of the uh, uh, some of the applications, such as metagenomics, methylation, but I've sort of really learned a lot from these people. And I wanted to say that, uh, you know, my students and postdocs all move on, and so soon there will be space for you. Uh, so if any of you are interested in this and have a background in biology and computer science, uh, mathematics, statistics, uh, uh, all of this comes into play, and I'd be very happy to talk to you uh, later today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for really this uh, modern introduction, really posing the questions, some solutions, and a lot of uh, concept around uh, these uh, new data stories. So uh, the floor is open to questions, comments. I know that it's a bit uh, tricky to get out to the microphone, but please uh, make an effort. And as you can imagine, I can't see you, so. Hello. I had a question. Yes. Please. Um, Sorry, was there a question? Yes, over here. Over the other side of the room. Oh, yes. Hi. Go ahead. Um, so I was just wondering, in an algorithm like Express, do you need to know all the transcripts in advance? Like, what do you do about alternative splicing? Yes, so in Express, the input presumes that you already know the target sequences. And so you would have to know all of the transcripts that form a gene. If you were doing RNA-seq, for example, you'd have to know the gene and all its isoforms. And you would, you know, uh, start, Express starts from there. It's solely a tool to do the fragment assignment and density estimation. But you, there are other tools for assembling transcripts, but that's not doing that. Yes. Uh, just a small question. You mentioned in the in the one of the last slides uh, the issue of non-target when, when you don't have a reference genome or something to hook to. So how much is it harder? What's the situation, the state of the art in this on those uh, issues that become also very critical now? Yes. So um, no, it's a very good question. Um, you know, in the case of RNA seq, which many people care about. Uh, there are a number of transcriptome assemblers. Um, they're, they're quite good, you know, in the, it's, it's a little bit less clear in transcriptome assembly to define what success means um, because uh, it maybe depends a little bit on the abundance of the transcripts. And these assemblers are reasonably good in many cases at assembling transcripts when there is high coverage. But they are not very good overall at assembling an entire transcriptome, uh, especially in low coverage areas. And part of the reason, I think, is that um, the, the way that many of the assemblers currently have been written is by adapting DNA sequence assemblers um, rather than sitting down from scratch and thinking through what really needs to be done in the case of, of this setting. There are other assays uh, where people have started to look at ways to just simply avoid this, the kind of assembly issue altogether. Um, you might imagine if you just in these experiments, you, you have reads in condition A and reads in condition B, and often you're just interested, is the collection of reads different? And so you might hope to bypass the assembly in some cases as well. And there's some work in that direction. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. I wonder well, if you have ma very many dimensions, like proteomics, uh, transcriptomics, multiple um, histone modification assays, and DNA is a hypersensitivity, maybe up to 20 such dimensions. Is there any role model to follow in the analysis of this data? Any uh, papers you recommend looking at? Well, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this area and I'm working quite a lot on it. Um, what people have been doing is applying uh, you know, dimension reduction techniques, for example, principal components analysis uh, and other such techniques for reducing dimension. I'm afraid to say that I think many uh, cases uh, the tools being applied are not appropriate. Uh, just to give an example, almost every one of the uh, papers right now uh, on this kind of uh, encode style do PCA, for example. And in PCA, there's actually an underlying statistical model that 
that is, lies at the heart of the method, which makes an assumption that the variance uh, in, in the data is equal in every coordinate, uh, which is very inappropriate, actually, for this kind of data, um, because it's just not the case. It's, PCA is a great tool in other settings, but here it's... So people are kind of taking out-of-the-box methods and applying them. Um, uh, so that's why I gave this as an open problem. I think there actually is a lot of work to do, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, yes. So the, the difference you showed between uh, microarrays and RNA-seq, how much of that could be because of uh, you know, unannotated transcripts? And such? Uh, yeah, so I, um, I didn't get a chance to go into detail into the difference between microRNA and RNA-seq. I have other slides on that. But generally, first of all, it's important to realize uh, that many people uh, gloss over this actually, is that microarrays in some sense are a better assay than RNA-seq because they're absolute. Uh, RNA-seq inherently is a relative measurement. You only learn something about this transcript relative to that one because you're sampling randomly. Whereas because a microarrays are hybridization based, you get an actual absolute measurement. So a microarrays can actually be more accurate possibly in very low abundance settings. Um, the problem with microarrays is that they, um, in, in some sense, they're performing intersection count because you're only usually measuring um, expression over, let's say, in a tiling array for a specific sequence shared among uh, transcripts. And I've just tried to argue for you that that's not a good thing to do. Uh, so, you know, there's inaccuracy due to that. And of course, the technology also is possibly less accurate. And we have done quite a detailed analysis where we find that overall RNA-seq is much, much more sensitive. Um, and I can show that to you later, but there's much greater uh, 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 fidelity and resolution for RNA-seq to, uh, to look for differential expressed genes. It's basically a better assay. And I would also add that in this paper we wrote, um, we wanted to see whether really you could replace uh, microarrays practically, and so we redid all the sequencing uh, th that we had done with high-seq Illumina sequencers with MySeq sequencers, and essentially show that even with very few reads on a MySeq, it's today cost effective to simply replace uh, uh, my, uh, you know, microarrays altogether. And this work was done, I should have said, um, in collaboration with the RIN lab uh, at, at Harvard. And they have, in fact, as far as I know, replaced all of their expression analyses by, by RNA-seq for this reason. So. Okay, thank you.